Christmas now. I'm sure you know about the great candle scandal for liturgical churches far and wide. There's a long story to answer the question of what color is the proper liturgical color for Advent? You could look this topic up on the World Wide Web and find innumerable resources to offer the history and innumerable opinions about what the church should do. These are fights that a select group of our seminary classmates loved to argue about. But Jody and I don't really wade into those fights very often. Originally, Advent was purple, just like Lent. Is that how it was when you were younger, maybe? It was seen as a mini penitential season, a time to prepare hearts and minds for the indwelling of the Christ child. This makes great theological sense. And personally, I'm drawn to Lent and the darkness and purple. I mean, I'm Dutch. Being a sinner in the hands of an angry God was a comfort to the Dutch. <laughs> but somewhere along the way, Western churches changed to serum blue changed to the color of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This tradition actually comes from an English tradition in Salisbury, serum, serum blue. Serum is the Latin word for Salisbury. This color represents hope and expectation. The Eastern Church never changed, they're still purple. But some other churches still have purple candles. In fact, Church of the Holy Trinity has purple candles. Do you remember what color the candles were at your home parish? Were they purple or blue? Purple. purple. Well, especially when churches have purple candles, the third Sunday uses rose or pink, right? I'm not supposed to say pink, it's rose. I don't know. I think I've even seen some churches with blue candles that do have a rose candle, but it usually fits best with the purple. Similarly, in Lent, the fourth Sunday is, ro is, is also rose, right? And it's called Laetare Sunday. In Lent, this rose is supposed to break up the penitential vibe a bit and offer some light. In Advent, the pink is the Sunday of joy. So that's what the fight is about. Maybe you have a strong opinion about it. Maybe we can fight about it at coffee hour. So this Advent has seemed a bit more penitential for me, actually a bit darker than normal. I wonder if that's true for you, too. But the joy of the third Sunday in Advent, Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent, is undeniable. Whether you have more of a serum approach or a penitential approach to Advent, the joy is there either way. I've never had a baby myself, but the birth of my children was pure joy. I couldn't wipe the smile off of my face for weeks. And even if you've not had children, my guess is that the coos and smiles of babies will bring a smile to the face of the Grinchiest of Grinches or the Scroogiest of Scrooges. <clears throat> babies are just so wonderful. They elicit joy. Puppies, kittens, baby otters. These things are all the same and make us all smile, right? Brings us joy. In some liturgical years, this is the week that John the Baptist does somersaults in the womb of Elizabeth as he leaps for joy at the announcement about his cousin, Jesus. John is joyful. But you have to dig a bit in the text from today to see John's joy, right? At first glance, John just seems like a crazy-haired, judgmental prophet. I mean, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. It's not exactly baby shower conversation, is it? <laughs> Here's what I had to do to arrive at a different place with John's text for this week. Luke's text about John for this week. First of all, he's talking to people who already followed him into the wilderness. These were people who heard Jesus' message, sorry, John's message of repentance, and who followed him and who were then baptized. So these folks were already baptized. I had to remind myself that these weren't the scribes or Pharisees that we usually see Jesus or John and the disciples bumping up against. John wasn't mad at these folks. They were doing what he asked them to do. They had faith in the process that he had laid out. So John is reminding these penitent people 
that now that they have been cleansed in the waters of baptism, that now the real work would begin. Don't just count on the faith of your ancestors. You need to be changed from the inside out. Your fruit must be the fruit of a person who has turned away from the ways that led you to the baptismal waters. You must be changed. The next step I needed to take was to realize that this question from the crowd wasn't said in a smarmy way. What then should we do, John? <laughs> and John gives them very practical and contextual answers to a real question. If someone doesn't have a coat, guess what? You've got two. You should give them one. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Sure, until you get called a socialist, right? <laughs> or until you try to decide if you should give away the better coat of the two you have or the less desirable one. Am I the kind of person to give away my better coat? Or am I the kind of person to give away my least desirable coat? Either way, what does that mean about me? And then the most despised individuals for the Jewish people, the Roman collaborating tax collectors, they needed to collect more taxes from individuals than was actually due so that they could have a salary. Their job was to tax their Jewish brothers and sisters and to give the money to the government that was oppressing them while making a salary for themselves. And they also came and were baptized by John. And what should we do, John? As tax collectors, what should our fruit look like? And John says, stop taking extra. Only collect the taxes that are due to Rome. Nothing more. Yikes. This would not have been good news for tax collectors. This eliminates their position, right? Why would they collect money for the Romans if they'd get nothing back? And soldiers had also repented and were there for baptism. What should we do, John? Stop using your position to extort money from the people. Stop using the threat of violence to enrich yourselves. Be honorable soldiers. Be satisfied with your wages or do something else. These are very practical responses for the crowds. There weren't, they weren't some overly spiritualized answer. They weren't some grand theological claim. They were practical. There were things they needed to do. And they would have caused very serious problems for these people. It would have made them unpopular with their families. It would have caused turmoil between their colleagues in the tax collecting business or the soldiering business. I'm sure you've experienced the isolation that can come when you change the way that a group of people has been doing things because you suddenly have a conscience or when you have to be the dissenting voice. My guess is that this is the same for soldiers that we ask to do impossible and terrible things. It must be nearly impossible to be a dissenting voice of reason in matters of life and death. The things that John is asking of these individuals would have been devastating and life-altering. And that is the case for those of us that follow the ways of Jesus, right? We will be misunderstood at times. We will be judged differently by folks on both ends of the spectrum and in between. I'm not saying this is a woe is me, I'm just another Christian martyr kind of way. I'm not talking about blurting out Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays. I'm not talking about turning the radio to the Christian radio station when your friends get in the car so that you can convert them or embarrass yourself trying. But Christians have a particular way of being that goes against the grain, right? That is subversive at times, that can put us on the outside. It's baked into our episcopi. And I think that this is where the joy is. When we realize that we need to change, or we realize that our values may lead us to isolation. We rest in the arms of the divine. There's joy in living into something difficult. Joy in living into our baptism. 
joy in serving others, joy in watching our brothers and sisters get involved in the work of the kingdom of God. Anything in life where we come to a new realization, where we have been off track, and someone or something brings clarity, that's a matter of joy, I think. It can be easy to live in the past and to beat yourself up, but a healthier way to see it is that you have once again found your way on the path. There's joy in being back on track. Maybe this is the case for you. Maybe around issues of sobriety, or if you've caused a sibling or spouse or child unnecessary pain or suffering with your actions. I'm sure the possibilities are endless. Can you think of examples in your life? A time when you discovered a new answer to the question, how then should I live? Because, Philippites, your baptism is your repentance. Your baptism is what has turned you from walking your own path and has instead put you on the path of the divine. And when we are on the path of the divine, we have made space for God to break into our lives, to impregnate us so that we can give birth to all that is good, hope, peace, love, to give birth to joy. So embrace the joy today. Embrace the fact that God has broken into your life, even if and when it causes you problems. May this week be a week for you that is filled with joy, that is pink and rose. May you rejoice in the expectancy of the upcoming birth of God. Amen. Amen.